thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you much, Pedro. And first of all, let me thank uh, IBSA for the kind invitation to this uh, very uh, interesting meeting. Yes, I've been asked to speak about uh, how to predict and how to avoid excessive ovarian response to gonadotrophin uh, stimulation. And uh, in the next uh, 25, 30 minutes, I'm going to speak about the definition and consequences of hyperresponse, how to predict hyperresponse itself. And uh, uh, I will speak about the primary prevention of hyperresponse to gonadotrophin stimulation. Well, uh, dear colleagues, so you may agree with me that uh, hyperresponse is the basis uh, for the successive development of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. And uh, nowadays, uh, risk factors for HSS include uh, young age, low body weight, PCOS, high ovarian reserve, rapidly increasing estradiol during ovarian stimulation, but also large number of growing follicles, as well as a high number of uh, retrieved oocytes. And so you may understand many of these risk factors are clearly indicating an impending hyperresponse to gonadotrophin stimulation. How to define hyperresponse? Well, if we look at the literature, many authors uh, used to define hyperresponse on the basis of the number of growing follicles. Many others, I said, on the basis of serum levels of estradiol. But without that, the vast majority of authors used the number of retrieved oocytes to define hyperresponse. And if we look at papers, we can find that 15, 14, 16, 20 retrieved oocytes are probably uh, the most used numbers to define hyperresponse. More interestingly, a group of US colleagues uh, recently published this retrospective analysis of uh, IVF cycles, a very large number of IVF cycles, more than 250,000 IVF cycles, and they were able to calculate that probably 15 is the best number to uh, uh, identify those patients who will have ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, you can see the sensitivity and the specificity were, were acceptable. And so, yes, probably 15 may be the best number to identify and to define hyperresponder patients. Also in the same papers, authors give us this nice feature, this nice figure. Uh, you can see here the relationship existing between number of retrieved eggs and uh, the risk of HSS. Well, this relationship is linear for low numbers of retrieved oocytes. But if we look at hyperresponders, well, you can see here an exponential increase in the risk of HSS, which means clinically that uh, even a small increase in the number of retrieved oocytes in this kind of uh, uh, patients would lead to a great increase in the risk of developing OHSS. And also, uh, in the same uh, paper, authors uh, uh, could confirm that hyperresponse is associated to a relative decrease in the chance of success following IVF. So I like very much this figure because you can find here two reasons by which we don't want hyperresponse in our IVF patients because of the great risk of OHSS and also because the relative decrease in the live birth. And also hyperresponse seems to be associated to some increased perinatal risk. We looked at the, the outcome in uh, uh, more than uh, 65,000 live births and we could find a significant association between retrieved oocytes and early preterm birth and low birth weight. So, in my opinion, this is the third reason by which we should avoid hyperresponse in IVF cycles because of increased perinatal risk. How much prevalent is hyperresponse in our clinics? If we look at the huge, large numbers coming from the uh, UK or USA uh, registers, we can see that the expected prevalence of hyperresponse is in between 17 to 28 percent. So probably it is very high. From my point of view, this means that in my IVF clinic, probably one out of five, one out of three women 
will have some risk of developing what I said following ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. What is the pathogenesis of hyperresponse? That's very clear to all of you. You may have hyperresponse only if you are treating, only if you are giving gonadotrophins to women with a very rich ovary, with an ovary, with a large pool of recruitable antral follicles. And do you know the number of antral follicles declines throughout female aging? This uh, very clearly explain why the prevalence of hyper response declines throughout female aging as well. The vast majority of patients with hyper response uh, is indeed young women. Hyper response depends on the number of antral follicles, and you know we can now measure this number. So this means that we can predict it. We can predict women at risk of developing hyper-response by measuring the new uh, markers. I'm talking about AMH and antral follicle count. You know these two markers are very strongly and significantly related, and that the higher the AMH, the higher the antral follicle count, the higher the expected ovarian response and the, uh, the risk of developing hyper-response itself. At least in expert centers, the two biomarkers have a very good, a very similar diagnostic performance. We were able to calculate uh, uh, 3.5 nanogram ml, which is uh, something like uh, 25 p mol per L as the best kind of value for image for predicting hyper response. For the answer follicle count, we found 14 as an acceptable kind of value. Also, large individual patient data meta-analysis uh, could confirm the diagnostic accuracy of these two markers and also confirm that the two markers may have a very similar diagnostic performance. In this paper, coming from the Netherlands, well, authors found a diagnostic accuracy of a rock area under the curve of 0 0.8, 0 0.79, which means, from a statistical point of view, that the diagnostic marker uh, has a clinical uh, a power, is, it is clinically acceptable. However, not everybody agree on this. If we look at some recent multicentric uh, study, such as this one, well, in this study, it was shown that probably AMH may have some advantages when compared to the answer follicle count. Please look at the left side of this slide. You can see here, uh, well, huge variability in the relationship between antral follicle count and female aging in seven different clinics. But this was not the case for the AMH. Uh, look how uh, concordant are the relation, the different lines in, in this slide. So, well, this is because AMH uh, uh, seems to have lower intercenter variability when compared to the antral follicle count. And this can also explain why in some multicentric trial, AMH had the better performance in uh, predicting hyper-response when compared to the answer follicle count. The red line is for AMH, the black line is for the answer follicle count. It is clear that the performance of AMH was superior when compared to the answer follicle count. Again, this probably was due to the high inter-center variability of answer follicle count. But anyway, we are now able to predict in an acceptable way the occurrence of hyper response. So this means that we can prevent it. And when talking about prevention, we have to talk about primary prevention, which aims to prevent disease before it occurs. And when talking about a hyper response and HSS, this means submaximal ovarian stimulation, and the use of generation antagonist protocol. The secondary prevention aims to reduce the impact of disease that has already occurred, and this means the use of generation antagonist triggering or the freeze-all strategy. The tertiary prevention, when talking about OHSS, well, it means the proper treatment of the disease itself. Today, I'm talking just about the primary prevention of hyper-response. First of all, when we predict the occurrence of hyper-response, 
we have to sub-maximally stimulate the ovary. And many years ago, different authors proposed the use of a combination of clomiphin plus FSH as a tool to sub-maximally stimulate the ovary. And indeed, this was efficient. You can see here, there's a, 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 a huge decrease in the rate of OHSS when you are going to use clomiphene in IVF cycle. But at the same time, there's a very high rate of cycle cancellation. Cycle cancellation because of a poor response. Because probably clomiphene, well, leads to um, weak ovarian stimulation. Too weak for many women. And so you have to cancel the cycle in one out of five, one out of three women. But we are talking about women with very rich ovary. And so from a clinical point of view, this is not acceptable. Indeed, in my opinion, the right strategy to treat patients expected to be hyper responders is to reduce the dose of FSH. This is an old concept. This is a trial published uh, 12, 13 years ago Young women so expected to have a good ovarian reserve were randomized to receive two different doses, two different FSH starting doses, 150 units or 225 units. And as you can see here, the use of the low dose of FSH was associated with a significant decrease in the number of retrieved oocytes. And this finding has been confirmed in many trials. Look how consistent is the finding in these trials. So it's true. When we are using a low dose of FSH in our patients, in some way we are reducing the number of retrieved oocytes, hence the risk of developing OHSS. Let's look at these two graphs. This is the curve of distribution of retrieved oocytes when giving a fixed dose of 225 units or 150 units. When using the 150 units dose, the curve of distribution is completely shifted to the left, which means that, yes, we are reducing the rate of hyper-response, but at the same time, we are increasing the rate of iatrogenic response. What is iatrogenic poor response? It's a poor response in a woman with a rich ovary due to a low dose of FSH, too low for that specific patient. So from my point of view, it is very clear. Some women need a low, some others a high dose of FSH. Hence, the dose of FSH must be personalized. And personalization of the FSH dose has been the objective of this new important trial called the Optimist trial. This has been presented during the Escher in Helsinki, and uh, this is a Dutch multicentric non-sponsored trial uh, in which uh, 1,500 patients have been included. But Today, we are interested in hyper-responders, and as you can see here, in one part of this trial, women with a rich ovary have been included, women with 16 to 40 antral follicles, and they were randomized to two different doses of gonadotrophins, namely 100 units or 150. Well, in the end, they had uh, uh, something like 500 patients included in this trial, who were randomized to the two different doses of FSH. The primary outcome was the live birth rate in 18 months after randomization. Uh, this because patients, well, they underwent consecutive uh, many IVF cycles in uh, uh, one year and a half. And well, if we look at the live birth rate, no differences at all in the first IVF cycle nor in the cumulative live birth rate. But let me show you the secondary outcomes. The number of retrieved oocytes is significantly reduced when, used, when they used 100 units of uh, gonadotrophin versus 150. The cancellation rate for hyper-response was significantly reduced. No differences in the rate of severe OHSS. And importantly, there was a very high rate of cancellation because of poor response. 
in women treated with the fixed dose of antigen units. Again, this is because of iatrogenic response. This is because many women, although they had rich ovary, were treated with a low dose of FSH. Probably in the Optimist trial, uh, authors uh, did not really investigate the concept of personalization. That just, they just compared to fixed doses of gonadotrophins. Indeed, in my opinion, personalization of the FSH dose means the fine adjustment of the dose at single individual level. You know we have published in the last few years uh, um, two different formulas based on AMH or antifollicle count to personalize the FSH dose. And the concept behind this is that we considered AMH and antifollicle count for what they are, two continuous variables. The higher the AMH, the higher the antifollicle count, the lower the FSH studying dose. So FSH studying dose should be a continuous variable. Let's come back to the Optimist trial. Uh, authors included in this trial women with rich ovaries, but you may understand in the clinical practice, uh, 15 answer follicles is different from 30, that is different from 40. However, these patients received the same fixed dose, 150 or 100 units. And you may agree with me that probably 100 units is too low for this patient on the left side. And 150 units is too high for the patient on the right side. Indeed, if I apply our antrophological count nomogram to these patients, I will calculate a dose of 150 units for patients with 15 antral follicles, 112 units for patients with 25 antral follicles, and 75 units for patients with 35 follicles. And so this is what I have in my mind when I think about personalization of the FSH studying dose. Very recently, we have retrospectively applied the antrophological count nomogram on a population of patients treated in another hospital. In this hospital, patients received the FSH studying dose according to clinician experience, and this is the distribution of what they received. And if we look at ovarian response, well, in this hospital, 75 out of 435 patients developed hyper-response, and if we are retrospectively apply the antrophological count formula, well, in something like half of them, the FSH starting dose would have, uh, would, would have been lower than what they actually received, and I think that's interesting from a clinical perspective. This will be the distribution of the FSH starting dose according to the antrophological count nomogram. Again, this is what I call personalization. You can see here the full spectrum of all possible FSH studying dose you may select. More importantly, we have recently completed a single center randomized control trial for the external validation of the AMH formula to uh, select the proper FSH studying dose in the clinical practice. The objective of this trial was to demonstrate an increase by at least 20% in the proportion of women with optimal ovarian reserve, uh, sorry, ovarian response, and uh, uh, well, this was arbitrary, and uh, we defined optimal ovarian response as the retrieval of 8 to 14 eggs, 8 to 14 oocytes, and patients were randomized into two groups. In the first group, the FSH starting dose was uh, fixed, and was 150 for young women and uh, uh, 200, uh, 25 units in older patients. Uh, in the nomogram group, the dose was uh, personalized according to the AMH values. And uh, this is the distribution of the FSH uh, doses, just two possible doses for the fixed group, 150 or 225 units. And again, the distribution of all possible FSH doses in the personalized group. The curve of distribution, the curves of distribution of retrieval oocytes were different in the two groups. The black line is for the personalized group and the, the gray line 
is for the fixed group, and uh, clearly there was uh, a significant increase in the proportion of patients with appropriate ovarian response. We, indeed, we were able to show statistical significance for the primary outcome, which was, again, the number of patients with appropriate ovarian response from 42 to 63%, but also as a secondary outcome, there was a significant decrease in the proportion of patients with a low ovarian response that in this study uh, was defined as lower than eight oocyte. And when talking about hyperresponder patients, there was a decrease from 17 to 10. We failed to show any significant difference here, but you can understand this probably is because of the low number of patients in this group of uh, uh, responders. And anyway, on the basis of this finding, we calculated that we need 400 patients to be included in the trial to show statistical significance also for this outcome. Some other authors proposed in the last few years to use AMH uh, to select the proper dose of uh, uh, FSH, and in this phase two trial published on fertility and sterility, authors gave different uh, doses of uh, uh, FSH uh, delta to patients, and then they analyzed the, the resulting ovarian response. They divided patients according to values of AMH, low or high AMH, and as you can see here, in all patients, the higher the FSH starting dose, the higher the number of retrieved oocytes. But if you look at the blue line, which is indicating women with higher MH, well, this is more and more evident. So clinically speaking, this means that mainly patients with a expected to be hyper-responders because of high ovarian response uh, reserve, mainly these patients will benefit from the personalization of the FSH study dose. And according to these results, authors were able to calculate a formula that is based on AMH and body weight uh, to select the proper dose of FSH, which, is, which has to be different on the basis of basal AMH. This concept has been recently tested in a multinational, multicentric randomized control trial that again has been presented at least in part during the, the last ASHREN uh, 1,300 patients randomized into two groups. They received a fixed dose of 150 units or a personalized dose of FSH on the basis of AMH. The ongoing pregnancy rate was the uh, main outcome, was the primary outcome, and as you can see here, there was no statistical differences uh, in, in, in uh, success rates. However, again, let me show you secondary outcomes. Uh, there was a significant increase in the proportion of women with appropriate ovarian response in patients treated with the personalized dose versus the fixed dose. And if we look at patients expected to be hyper-responders because of high MH, well, in these patients, the use of a personalized FSH dose was associated to a significant decrease in the number of retrieved oocytes and also there was a significant decrease in the proportion of women with a very high number of retrieved oocytes. As a consequence of this, there was a significant decrease in the rate of OHSS, something like a 50% decrease in the cases of OHSS or in cases uh, of patients uh, needing preventive interventions because of OHSS. So yes, the personalization of the FSH starting dose is useful mainly in patients with high ovarian reserve, in patients expected to be hyper-responders. The other relevant, important strategy to reduce the hyper-response in IVF cycles is the use of generation antagonist protocol. Since the generation antagonist per se reduces the number of retrieved oocytes minus 1.6 eggs less when we are using generation antagonist according to this meta-analysis as a consequence. There's a reduction in the OHSS rate in the Alinani meta-analysis published a few months ago, and based on more than 5,000 observations, it was able to confirm a 50% reduction in the OHSS development just because of the use of generation antagonist.
And uh, more importantly, a few months ago in human reproduction, a very relevant, multicentric, uh, uh, non-sponsored trial has been published. Uh, this comes from uh, uh, North Europe. Uh, a thousand patients have been included in this trial. They were randomized to receive the Generich, the long standard Generich agonist protocol versus the Generich antagonist protocol. The FSH starting dose was the same, and the authors could confirm that when we are using Generich antagonist, where there's a significant reduction in the total dose, in the total uh, consumption of FSH, in the total duration of ovarian stimulation, and in the number of retriedocytes, minus 1.7 eggs less when we use general age antagonists. But let me show you the primary outcome. You can see here, again, a significant reduction in the prevalence, in the incidence of uh, late OHSS and total OHSS. 50% decrease. This has been confirmed. Also, there was a 50% decrease in the number of patients admitted to the hospital because of OHSS. And importantly, the life birth rate per starter cycle, per all sites retrieval, and per embryo transfer is the same. So my colleagues, I think now we have very strong evidence. I think we can conclude that probably the use of generation antagonist must be considered mandatory in IVF cycles in women expected to be hyper-responders. But you know, my friends, sometimes you may use low dose of FSH and generation antagonist, and you may have a hyper-response. In our daily clinical practice, even if we are personalizing the FSH dose and we are using generation antagonist protocol, you may have large ovaries, and so on the day of HCG, you have to take some decision. You have to decide whether to cancel the cycle, whether to induce with a ACG and then uh, freeze all, or whether to use the generation agonist triggering. But of course, I'm not talking uh, uh, anymore about primary prevention. This is secondary prevention. This is prevention of HSS. And so this is another story. So dear colleagues, let me conclude with a few second messages. Cyber response we said seems to be associated to relative decrease in the life birth rate and perinatal outcome in IVF cycles. It also confers to patients great risk of developing OHSS. But hyper response may be predicting by, used, by using AMH and, and or antrophological count with a good, with an acceptable diagnostic performance. And prediction is the key for an effective preventive strategy for OHSS. Primary strategy includes the use of a low a personalized dose of uh, uh, FSH. Trials to date uh, demonstrate a substantial decrease in the rate of a hyper response when using tailored FSH doses. The use of generation antagonists may be considered mandatory in these patients. The mean number of retrieval sites is significantly reduced when using the antagonist, as well as the incidence of OHSS. Finally, in patients developing hyper-response, despite the use of generic antagonists and the personalization of the FSH dose, the use of generic antagonist protocol itself will permit the triggering with the generic uh, agonist, and so the secondary prevention of OHSS. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Antonio. Uh, for keeping on time, we have five minutes for questions and discussions. Do we have questions from the floor? Dominique? Uh, Antonio, this, this was a great talk. A great talk, but you, you are describing a way. Now, I sympathize, and this was really nice. But you're describing a way of reducing OHSS by 50%. But is it not the time that we have zero OHSS now? Mm. Is it not the time that if the fear of OHSS is there, we should freeze all? And is it not unacceptable to have OHSS? Yeah. So which is, which is a different strategy. Yes, th thank you, Dominic. Thank you for, for this question, because it gives me the possibility to expand on one concept. We have good markers. 
to predictable response. They have a good diagnostic performance that is not 100%. It is 70, 75%. This means that sometimes our prediction is wrong. And this is true for the prediction of hyperresponse, but also for the prediction of those women who will develop ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. This means that sometimes you may have patients with a, a no so high number of retrieved oocytes in whom you will transfer the embryo and they will develop the ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. So from my point of view, we can reduce, we can reduce, we can reduce more and more the OHSS rate in our clinics, but there's just one strategy to have zero OHSS cases, and that's the freeze-all strategies for everybody. Otherwise, we have to be ready to have one case, hopefully one case in, in a thousand patients developing OHSS, in a patient not expected to be at risk of this. Hello. Thanks for a most wonderful presentation. Uh, we're from London. Do you uh, agree? I cannot see you. No. Can you raise your hand, please? Right. Okay. okay. Where? Um, um, very good presentation. Um, do you agree, then, that instead of talking about um, mild stimulation, we should change it to appropriate stimulation, which means that, you know, mild, 150 might be mild for somebody, but as you showed, maybe too much for somebody else. Uh, and also, in your group, do you see, uh, sometimes the AMH is not quite, uh, in my opinion, as good as it can be, because it might give you slightly um, what might appear ultimately to be um, a wrong, a wrong uh, level, because if you base it on it, you find that you're still doing too much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, mild stimulation is a, a wonderful strategy to reduce the rate of HSS. The point is that if you use mild stimulation to all patients entering in the IVF program, you have to be ready uh, to, to a high rate of cancellation because of poor response because you are, you, are, you are shifting, well, in some way you are uh, moving the curve of distribution of retrieval oocytes to the left. So the mean number of retrieval oocytes when using the mild stimulation is reduced. And so this means an increase in the proportion of women with a very low uh, uh, number of retrieval oocytes. Again, from my point of view, mild stimulation is a very great strategy, but it has to be personalized. I mean, you have to select patients who need mild stimulation. AMH is a hormone. AMH can, can vary. A, a couple of years ago with, uh, with George, we published a review analysis, a review article on the variability of AMH, and we analyzed all possible sources for AMH variability. But ovarian response is a biological variable, and indeed, it varies. That's the point. There's one uh, nice paper published a couple of years ago in which authors analyzed the ovarian response expressed in terms of retrieval oocytes in consecutive IVF cycles in the same patients, treated in the same way, and sometimes there's a very huge variability in ovarian response. So ovarian response varies. AMH and antral follicle count varies too. But now is the best we have. Without the new biomarkers, we should base all our decisions just on female age, which is not enough. We have time for a very short last question. Juan Chavarcia Velasco. Yeah, it yeah, works. Nice, nice lecture, Antonio. Uh, just a comment uh, in the same line of, of your last uh, answer now. Um, I completely agree with the concept of personalized medical care. But as you said, there's this paper from Rombauts and, and Griesinger, who may be in the room, showing a 25% variation cycle to cycle using the same medication. So do you think that's something that we have to accept uh, because we're treating patients and patients are, are different? Or do you think we can do better using your uh, algorithm? Yeah. Yeah, Quancho, this is, uh, this is what I said. I mean, um, uh, this depends on uh, the new concept of follicular waves. 
during one single cycle and during consecutive menstrual cycles. So ovarian response, again, is a biological variable. It varies. And all variables associated and in some way investigating the pool of antral follicles are varying, you know? And so the point is, the point is, from a clinical point of view, the point is how many patients with a low ovarian reserve will have a high ovarian reserve in the next menstrual cycles. The proportion is very low, fortunately. And so this means why we are succeeding in our clinical practice. Sometimes we take decisions for our patients not on the basis of an answer follicle count measurement performed just today, but probably we are deciding on the basis of the answer follicle count performed a couple of months ago or on the basis of the ovarian response the patient had a couple of months before. Because we know that very, very probably the patient will have an ovarian response in the same, of the same degree that she had. But all clinicians know that sometimes you, you may have variability, and sometimes very, this variability is very, very relevant. Thank you very much, Antonio, for your talk. And thank you.